driving blast off. He went, okay. He goes, I got two guys <coughs> coming in, and you got to meet these guys. It's a day of arrest in Elon Musk. And so we come in, I, I dust off my best business plan, you know, we're going to the moon. <laughs> and I pitch a day on Elon, and they're like so focused on Mars. I think you're focused on putting a Mars around, a mouse around Mars at the time. That's another long conversation. And, and so they went into that, and so I start pitching on the X Prize. And uh, Adeo joins my board of the X Prize, becomes at that time a huge donor, right? This was like uh, the money that kept us in survival mode. Uh, Elon ended up joining Mars Society board. <laughs> Realized the ill, ill of his ways and joined the X Prize board a year later. But it was an amazing, amazing time. And so I'm thankful for all, who you are and all that you do, Adeo. Uh, <laughs> I told him if I told that story, he'd say something nice about me. So. <laughs> All right, so uh, let's jump in. Out of curiosity, uh, how many folks here are have either read Abundance or Bold? If you could raise your hand, so a few of you. Okay. Um, thank you. Thank you for that. <laughs> so I spend a lot of time thinking about the fact that an entrepreneur today can touch the lives of a billion people. Right? That's an insane statement to make. Just that notion. You used to have to be you know, Jeff Immelt at GE or Mutartan at Coca-Cola to have that kind of an impact. But today, that's what any one of us can do. It's what you can do. You can create a product, a service, a company that can positively impact the lives of a billion people. And just down the road here in Mountain View, uh, as David mentioned, I'm proud to be the co-founder with Ray Kurzweil, the institution you call Singularity University. We have about 8,000 applicants for 80 spots uh, for our graduate program that takes place in June, July, and August. And during the course of the summer program, your objective is to start a company, a product, or a service that can touch the lives of a billion people in 10 years. So uh, we call that 10 to 9 plus impact. We're backed by an extraordinary group of companies. And we also run executive programs. But the basic concept is that if you want to become a billionaire, help a billion people. The world's biggest problems are the world's biggest business opportunities. This beautiful alignment that exists, right? And so it gives me great hope for the future. So we teach exponentials and exponential growth. And the challenge is that all of us are local and linear thinkers in a world that is global and exponential. When I say, what does exponential growth feel like? The first thing you say is, what is linear? If I said to you, you know, I'm, you know, all of you take you know, 30 linear steps, you know, one, two, three, four, five, and 30 steps. I'm in the back of the room here, and you all know, and you can all tell me, they're in five, they're in 10, they're in 20. We are great linear projectors. And the challenge is that we make a lot of things look linear. So in 30 steps, I'm 30 meters away. The challenge, however, is that the world is growing technologically exponentially. And exponential is a simple doubling. 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32. You see, if we're going to be in 30 doublings, let's even memorize, you're not 30 meters away, you're a billion meters away. To put it differently, you've gone around the planet 26 times. And the disconnect between 30 linear steps in the back of the room and 30 exponential steps, I mean, you know, I've seen a whole bunch of sunrise, sunrises and sunsets is what gets us in trouble. And it looks like this. This red line is all of us, right? It's our investors, it's our politicians, it's our kids. We're all local and linear thinkers. We haven't had a hard, you know, hardware or software upgrade in 50,000 years. It's, it's been a while. That yellow line is the technology that you're creating, that you're using. It's AI, robotics, synthetic biology, 3D printing, you know, computers, networks, sensors. It's growing and doubling year on year, over and over again, at this extraordinary rate. And the difference between those two is disruptive stress or disruptive opportunity, depending on your point of view. Right? So if you're the CEO of a Fortune 500 company and you know, a startup out of the Founders Institute comes along and challenges a product or service, it's disruptive stress. If you're the entrepreneur, it's disruptive opportunity. So the example I give that is near and dear to my heart is the one in the story of Kodak that I opened my second book, Bold with. 
And it's the notion that in 1996, Kodak was the top of its game. You know, a company on the Dow like none other. 140,000 employees, $20 billion market cap. What most people don't realize is that 20 years earlier, in 1976, Kodak had invented the digital camera. The challenge was that even though they had the patents, the first mover advantage, their board didn't understand exponential growth. And so when Stephen Sasson walks into the boardroom of Kodak with a digital camera the size of a small toaster that takes 0 0.01 megapixel images, they go, what are you kidding me? That's a toy for kids. We're Kodak. We make beautiful high resolution images. Besides, we're in the paper and chemicals business. And they ignore it. And of course, in 2012, Kodak goes bankrupt, put out of business by the very technology that they had invented, they had the first mover advantage for. They forgot what business they were truly in. And the notion is that today there are a whole slew of companies that have forgotten what business they're truly in. And you will disrupt them. Because in this day and age, in this time, when the only constant is change, the rate of change is increasing, the other truth is you either disrupt yourself or someone else will. In this case, Kodak did not disrupt themselves. But here's the interesting point. In the same year of 2012, another company in the memory or imagery business called Instagram gets acquired by Facebook for a billion dollars. But they've got only got 13 employees. Right? And so I've given this moment in time where a linear thinking company is disrupted by exponential technology a name. I call it the new Kodak moment. <laughs> um, and we're going to see that a lot, right? The stats from the Owen School of Business state that over the next decade, 40% of today's Fortune 500 companies will no longer be around, which means we haven't heard of the 40% that will be part of the Fortune 500 a decade from now. Put differently, this is from Richard Foster at Yale, who said, if you started a company in the 1920s that got into the S&P 500, that company had an average of 67 years before it was disrupted, before it fell off S&P 500. Things changed slowly enough that you can sit back, milk it, and enjoy the ride. Today, you start a company, you got a 15-year average run on the S&P 500. You're MySpace, worry about Facebook, worry about Google+, whatever's next. And what this translates to as well, which is why you're all here, is the rate at which we're going from I've got an idea to I run a billion dollar company is faster than ever before, right? My friend Chad Hurley starts YouTube on his credit cards, sells it to Google 18 months later for $1.6 billion. You know, Instagram, crazy idea to invest a billion dollars in this company, right? It's worth $35 billion today. If I had gone to the you know, heads of the limousine fleets, taxi companies, rental car companies, there's five guys are gonna start this product and service, they're never gonna buy a single car. They're gonna display 60% of the taxi fleet in San Francisco, be worth $40 billion in five years. Oh my God, that's unfathomable. And so the challenge is, how do you create new business models which are unfathomable to the existing companies, that 40% will collapse? And you will. You're going to change healthcare. You're going to change education. You're going to change insurance. You're going to change food. You're going to change all these things. And it's not a matter of if, it's just a matter of when. So all of this is being made possible by this curve, right? This is five generations of increasing computational power. How much computational power $1,000 could buy you in 1900 to 2010? And what you want to see on this curve is the following. It's a pretty smooth curve, right? You don't see World War I, World War II, the recession, depression, and so forth. It's using faster computers to build faster computers to build faster computers. The other is this is on a log scale. And on a log scale, an exponential line looks like what? A straight line, right? But it's curving upwards, which tells us the rate at which we're building faster computers is in fact accelerating. And I love this graphic. So this is five megabytes in 1956 for $120,000. You'd have a cargo airplane move five megabytes around, right? This is 128 megabytes for 99 bucks in 2005. Extraordinary progress. 
And then of course this is 120 gigabytes for 99 bucks nine years later. Now, if you're like me, you don't even think about this, right? A thousand fold increase. And you just go, oh, more photos, that's nice. <laughs> you forget about the fact that that's miraculous. <laughs> That's fucking awesome. <laughs> Put it in the jail account. <laughs> and a 30 fold, million fold increase, right? Amazing progress we think nothing about. I'm going to give you a chance to download these slides at the end, by the way. Um, and if you look at the computational growth, this is a computer in 2010, you know, five years ago, calculating at 100 billion calculations per second. Eight years from now, the average computer is calculating the rate of your brain, my brain, the rate at which we do visual and auditory patterning, which is 10 to 60 cycles per second. And 25 years later, it's now the rate of the entire human race. Right? Now your kid's homework is really simple. <laughs> yeah, my homework is right. So when I teach this, I talk about the six Ds of exponential. The first is that anything that becomes digitized, biology, medicine, manufacturing, all of these things enter this period of slow, deceptive growth, right? It's that 0.01 megapixel camera from Kodak that the next year was 0.02, then 0.04, then 0.08. It all looks like zero. No one notices it. In the deceptive phase of exponential growth, it really is difficult to see. But then it becomes disruptive, and 30 doublings later, it's a billion times. It's too late. You've been crushed by the tsunami of technological change. All right, so I say to you, how many of you here had heard about 3D printing five years ago? Raise your hand. 10 years ago, 15, 20. It's a 32-year-old technology. It's just been in deceptive growth until it becomes disruptive. And when it does, it dematerializes, demonetizes, and democratizes technologies. What does that mean? Here's dematerialization. 20 years later, all of these things fit in your pocket. <laughs> 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 right? This is why, this is why Radio Shack's going out of business. We dematerialize all the shit they used to sell. <laughs> it's free. Not your fault. Seriously. It's awesome. I don't carry a GPS and a dashboard in my car anymore. It's on my phone. It's much better. As is two way video Skype, video high definition. Video cameras, still cameras, all this stuff is bits, bits on my phone. When it becomes dematerialized, physically gone, right? And so I go to CEOs all the time and say, you know, I'm keynoting Jeff Immelt's uh, GE Ventures uh, in two weeks. He's like, which of your products or services are going to become dematerialized? Just went with an entrepreneur with dematerializing ultrasound machines. Amazing what he's done. Because when it does, it demonetizes those businesses. Right? Uber demonetized taxis, Skype on distance, Amazon, Google, Airbnb, Craigslist crushed the newspapers. Took the money out of the classifieds and put it back in your pocket, but pillaged its revenue model. And so the challenge or the advantage when it becomes demonetized is it becomes available to everyone, effectively for free. And you get this gigantic uh, democratization of these technologies around the world. So we're going to have a billion handsets in Africa in 2016. If you wanted to reach a billion people before, you need arms and legs in 100 countries, right? Again, you had to have been you know, the CEO of one of the biggest companies in the world. Today, all of us can theoretically reach a billion people. So what we're seeing is this dematerialization, demonetization, and democratization of the technologies that used to define wealth. Right? This is the whole concept around abundance. What we used to hold as scarce is now becoming abundant everywhere. You see, technology is the force that takes what was to be scarce, or used to be scarce, and makes it abundant. It used to be that knowledge was power. Today, a teenager in Mumbai on a smartphone has access to more knowledge and information than the President of the United States did 20 years ago. And by the way, Google for Larry Page and Google for that teenager in Mumbai, it's the same. It's democratization. Now imagine that level of democratization for everything. Healthcare, education, power, water. This is where we're going. 
So we're riding on top of this wealth of capability, riding on top of that exponential growth of Moore's Law. And all of these technologies, you know, the computing networks, robotics, 3D printing, Synbio, nanomaterials, AI, all of these are the tools that you now have to go play with. All right, today you have access to the technologies that are only possible with the largest corporations and governments 20 years ago. My kids, who turn four next month, are playing with two, uh, two boys, they're playing with technology that was a DOD secret 20 years ago, right? And it's now like 30 bucks. I mean, that's insane, and it's also true. The sensors, the AI that are in the drones that they play with would have been a military secret 20 years ago. It's child's play today. Let's talk about AI. I want to talk about some of these. This is what we teach in our Singularity University program in a lot more depth in seven days, not seven minutes, so I'm going to fly here. But AI is the ability for a computer to do what? To understand your question and search its memory banks for the best answer. It understands the cynicism, the humor, the irony, the confusion you might have, but still can search all the knowledge it has and deliver you the best answer. You may know it as Siri on your iPhone. I prefer Jarvis from Iron Man. And I think we're all going to have Jarvis within a 10 year period of time. And so, one of the best experiments, one of the best demonstrations was done by a guy named Michael Roden, who's a senior VP at IBM, who runs the Watson program in Watson this IBM supercomputer named after the founder of Watson, and to show how awesome Watson is, they decided to go up against the all two-time Jeopardy champions. The guy who won the most money, the guy who won the most games. I'm gonna show this video and then we'll talk about it, but watch as a human gets decimated. Right? Okay, you're in the first position. Please make the selection. Uh, I've never said this on TV. Check stake me for 200, please. <laughs> Kathleen Kenyon's excavation of this city mentioned in Joshua showed the walls had been repaired 17 times. What's in? What is Jericho? Correct. 400, same category. This mystery author and her archaeologist hubby dug in hopes of finding the lost Syrian city of Urkesh. What's in? Who is Agatha Christie? Correct. What's in? Who is Mary Leakey? You're right. What's in? What is creeped? Yes. Let's finish Chicks Dig Me. Chicks Dig Me. So what was Watson? Watson was a room-sized computer about the size of the stage. It was not hooked up to the internet. It had downloaded the computer into its memory bank, some 3,000 Power 7 core processors. It could process a million books per second. And it was a computer able to search its massive memory banks and pulled together the most relevant answers and give a probabilistic sort of uh, uh, ratio of the, the, the truth of its answer and then pick one and give it. So uh, now, of course, this demonstration I show you is like so two years ago, right? <laughs> and what's happened since then is that IBM has poured the Watson to the cloud. They put an open API on top of that. They put $100 million as a venture fund to invest in entrepreneurs to create new products and services. Anybody here playing with Watson? Okay, Grassley, we got one, two here, three, great. And I all urge you to because honestly, Watson and its derivatives and its competitors in your hands will disrupt billion dollar markets. So where's it going first? The first place they're going is to medical school. They've downloaded into Watson all the medical journals, all of the textbooks, all of the files, everything. It's not possible. I mean, let's not fool ourselves. You go into a doctor's office, you think the doctor actually understands what's really going on? I mean, give me a break. It's a 45% of the time you go to a doctor's office, you get the wrong diagnosis or wrong course of treatment. And it's impossible for any human to fathom what's going, all the lab tests that are available, looking at all the imagery and so forth. But Watson can, and Watson has already got a much higher success rate in cancer diagnostics than any human. But where else is Watson going? So you go into financial advising. It has they've created Watson's Chef. They've downloaded all the all of the cookbooks. Uh, Watson Sommelier. Watson, uh, you know, I love you know, Watson as a fashion uh, designer. <laughs> I mean. 
you know, I use Granimal still, but <laughs> anyway. Um, ultimately, it's the ability of an AI to gather this information and provide you as the user the best answer possible. So this for me is a great place for entrepreneurs to be thinking about playing on that open API, creating, app, creating applications where the, you're the interface between the consumer and the AI and giving them the answers they want. So that's artificial intelligence. Uh, we're talking about sensors and networks. So we're living in a world today of 12 billion connected devices, according to my friend Francisco. We're gonna get 50 to 100 billion devices by 2020. Each of those devices has on the end of them a dozen sensors. We're heading towards a world of a trillion sensors. A trillion sensors. And so it's gonna be possible for you to know anything you want, anytime you want, anywhere you want in the future. And you know this, right? That the companies that are crushing it are data-driven companies. And if you're not thinking about or actually being a data-driven company, you're dead already. You just don't know it yet. So how do you collect that data and mine that data? So this is the first digital camera. Here's Stephen Sasson, the guy who created this in 1976. Here's where it is today, right? It's a billion times better. But here's the point, this is where it is today. It doesn't stop here, it keeps going. It's gonna be a billion times better in 30 years again with high definition insect eyes woven into your clothing and micro drones there. I have no idea. It just has this base, this bias to believe that it's as good as it gets. Not true. This is the first inertial measurement in guys to or orbit, goddess to the moon, tens of millions of dollars, tens of pounds. It's a buck on your phone right now, right? And pretty soon it's gonna be free, molecular in size. Here's the first GPS, right? 120,000 bucks, 53 pounds. Imagine this thing on the dashboard of your SUV. <laughs> and of course, it's you know, a couple of bucks right now. Here's the point. These technologies, these sensors are exploding. And they're getting cheaper and cheaper, and they're getting ubiquitous, and they're getting everywhere. What do you want to know? Do you want to truly measure what's going on in nature? You can. You can know what's going on. A trillion sensors out in the world creating information about microclimates, vibrations. I think there's even an X prize for earthquake prediction because I think the sensors out there are gonna give us enough small bits and clues to give us a chance to make those predictions early. So that's sensors and networks. Let's talk about robotics. Anybody know what this is a photo of? Don't say anything. Yeah. What? Tesla, it's a Tesla plant. Anybody see the carbon-based overlord in the photograph? Let me help you. <laughs> I love the photo. So robots are entering every aspect of our lives. I mean, and talk about what allowed Tesla to go from never having created a car to creating the most spectacular car on the planet. No baggage from the past to pull into the future. Starting with a clean sheet, starting with the best of materials, the best of machine learning, the best of robotics. Skip this. Um, Here's another robot. Uh, this is Google's autonomous car. Larry in the front, Sergey in the back, or behind him. And what we don't realize is that these exponential technologies have this domino effect that they hit one over the other, over the other, over the other, over the other, and it's extraordinary. So I have two four-year-old boys, as I mentioned, fraternal twins. They're never gonna drive. They're not gonna drive. Google's success with autonomous car um, honestly has driven every single car company to, pl to announce plans for full or partial autonomy. And we're gonna enter a world where you don't own a car anymore, you own access to a car. You call a Ferrari on Friday night, and SUV on Saturday night, whatever you need, when you need it. And it's gonna drop the cost of car ownership by a factor of 10, where effectively will be, you know, it's already cheaper for me to Uber around than own a car. But now when the Uber is actually autonomous, it's gonna be even 10 times cheaper than it is right now. It'll be, you'll own a car because, isn't that quaint? <laughs> uh, but if you don't need to own a car, you don't need a driveway or a, park, you know, a parking garage. And in fact, because they don't crash, you can make your cars you know, five times lighter, they use less fuel. They don't need car insurance. You can put eight times as many cars on the road so you don't have to build as many roads. So my friends at Caterpillar are concerned about that. I have my friends that, who run Westfield Mall's Lau family about to deploy $10 billion in, in construction. And I'm saying, listen, the majority of your real estate is parking. 
You've got a 50 year horizon on your stuff. Are you designing this to have dual use? Because you're not going to be, the cars aren't even parking there. They're going to be dropping you off and going off and doing something useful. So I mean, just, all of these changes that occur from one set of assumptions. And there's a multitude more. Uh, I'm trying to what video I have uh, next year. Yes. So this is what allows the autonomous car to drive autonomously. It's a LiDAR on the roof. roof. It's a laser imaging radar. It's got 64 iSafe lasers going around, generating 750 megabytes, megabytes per second of data. This one LiDAR is seeing everything, right? It's seeing a car crash, it's seeing a person being pickpocketed, a squirrel climbing up the tree. It's getting an image of this. Imagine that one car, but 1% 1 of the US made 2 million cars, mapping everything, seeing everything. If you thought privacy wasn't dead yet, <laughs> it's going to get worse. Long gone, guess again. But that's just one device. We also have right now three private constellations on orbit. We'll soon be a dozen private constellations in orbit, and these constellations of satellites are seeing um, everything in half meter to five meter resolution, in high definition video. You want to know what your competition is doing in China? You can watch the raw supplies going into their factory, right, and the finished product coming out. It's mid-December. You want to know what Best Buy's sort of earnings report is going to be for January? You can count the number of cars in their parking lots. And if that isn't enough, whatever, you know, we're going to see drones explode on the scene. It doesn't matter what the FAA says. They're going to be so, you know, so small and so throwaway and so anonymous that they'll be imaging everything all the time. And whatever you know, Google Glass iterates to. So we're gonna be living in a world, part of this trillion sensor economy of perfect knowledge. You wanna know how many people have green IZOT t-shirts on the corner of Fifth and Madison? You can ask, you can know. You wanna know what the fashion design for the day is in Silicon Valley versus Manhattan? You can look at the images and have your AI process that information. There are so many business opportunities, it's insane. We are living during the most exciting time ever to be alive as an entrepreneur. Only superseded by tomorrow, which is gonna be even more insane. <laughs> 3D printing. I'm on the board of 3D Systems, full disclosure. I think it's one of the most disruptive and extraordinary technologies out there. We today have the ability to 3D print in full color in 300 different materials. Plastic, glasses, rubbers, titanium, human cells, in mixed materials, right? You can print a toy that's got glass and metal and rubber, plastic, all mixed in together. We just launched out of Singularity University, one of our startups is a company called Made in Space that launched a 3D printer at the space station so that instead of having to launch a Falcon 9 to go and do a resupply, in the future, you can send the bits up there and 3D print a, a, uh, you know, a tool if you want. So what are we 3D printing? Complex structures within structures. Complexity comes for free. Printing a solid block of materials and that structure, same time, but that complexity is cheaper because you use less materials. High temperature titanium turbine blades. The company that I have, I won't talk about much unless in Q&A, Planetary Resources, we're building a new generation of deep space droids. It's, think of it as uh, Imperial probe droids, but the kind of a gentler type. <laughs> we're 3D printing our integrated structures and propulsions and, and tankage. So we can bring the price down from hundreds of millions to a million or so. This is a person who lost the right lower limb, image the left, clipped the image, and 3D printed a composite prosthetic. For the ladies in the audience, it's, you know, it's Friday, you've got a gala tomorrow night, you know, you're aware, you go online, you see a beautiful dress designed in Bangladesh that morning, you get print in your closet, plus the shoes and the handbag, and then you recycle it. <laughs> you know, we're seeing uh, metal printers in jewelry, in dentistry, a whole slew of things. This is part of the disruption of a $10 trillion marketplace. I love this, it comes out of the 3D printer working perfectly. This is Max on my team. In October this year, the first 3D printed car was printed by an amazing guy, Jay Rogers. $15,000 for the car, eight kilometer range, 
who's initially a 40 hour print, they're on schedule for a 12 hour print. Now this is just, just the beginning, right? This is the, this is the Apple image writer making those, remember that sound? It's rough, but it's gonna get better. And we're going to start to see on-demand car that you design, that you choose, not wait a few weeks, it's printed that day. This is out of China, this is Winsun, that's 3D printing buildings. Buildings! <laughs> houses, 5,000 bucks, 10 houses in 24 hours, a 3D story apartment building with concretes and cements. So from the very small to the very large, on-demand, infinitely variable, very cheap, it's going to change how we manufacture. <laughs> the last technology I'm going to talk about is the field of longevity and genomics. I'm excited about this. It's probably a, uh, one of the companies I'm most excited that I've, I've founded on my 17. Um, this is one partner, Craig Venter, who sequenced the first human genome in 2001. It cost him $100 million in nine months of time. Today, it's 1000 bucks in a couple hours. The other co-founder, uh, Bob Hariri, who is one of the world's leading thinkers and scientists and businessmen in the field of, field of stem cell, uh, Bob's the CEO of Celgene Therapeutics. Celgene's a $100 billion company. The three of us got together and announced a company uh, 14 months ago called Human Longevity. Our mission is to make 100 years old at U60, to give you the aesthetics, the mobility, and the cognition at 100 that you have at 60 add 30 to 40 healthy years. So how are we doing this? We have built the world's largest genome sequencing facility. We are sequencing uh, at the run rate of 100,000 people per year, but not just, you know, your genome like 23andMe. This is 3.2 billion letters from your mother, 3.2 billion letters from your father, 30x coverage. We add your phenotype, we add your microbiome. You are 10 trillion human cells and 100 trillion bacterial cells. All of that gets sequenced, plus a full body MRI, metabolome, proteome. All of this goes into a massive database. And a guy named Franz Ock, who used to run Google Translate for 10 years and created that whole system of machine learning between 90 language pairs, now does the machine learning and the translation between the genome to say everyone with this disease had this genome sequence. One of the things that we're doing is very cool is we just sequenced 1,000 people and took high resolution photos of their face with 30,000 points, put that in machine learning protocol. We're crunching the numbers right now. And it's our belief that we're gonna be able to predict your photograph from your genome. So, it is crazy. So this is the world's population. We just crossed the seven billion mark. In 2010, we had 1.8 billion people connected. By 2020, the low estimate is that we're gonna go up to five billion people, which means three billion new minds are coming online. For me, this is one of the most amazing things as an entrepreneur to think about. Three billion new consumers. You never sold anything to, have never bought anything, have never uploaded or downloaded anything, are coming online. But here's what gets even more interesting. Because it's not just that, it's that Zuckerberg has announced with internet.org his intentionality to give everybody on, on the planet connected. Google with, with Google Loon. Elon's announced a $10 billion constellation. Richard Branson and Paul Jacobs have announced their own constellation, four different efforts <laughs> with the intention to provide a megabit per second to everybody on the planet. Right, so it's no longer this, it's now this. So what's it like when five billion new consumers are coming online? Holy cow. We ain't seen nothing yet. So imagine by 2025, billion new consumers. This is you know, tens of trillions of dollars flowing into the global economy. You know, what are these people gonna invent? What are they gonna discover? What are they gonna desire? You know, we're entering a time where that tech is gonna start flowing from the developing world. You know, problems are an opportunity. I think of a great problem as a great opportunity to mine. I look for problems. Start a, start a company in the business based on the problem. I'm sure you guys, this is what Adeo teaches. I hope. So four critical insights here. The first is the only constant is change and the rate of change is increasing. The second, you either disrupt yourself or someone else will. Competition, this is my pitch to the CEOs of the Fortune 500 companies. 
it's no longer a multinational overseas, it's you guys. You're the competition for the multinationals today. It's the exponential empowered entrepreneur. And finally, if you're dependent on innovation solely from inside your company, you will lose. This hyper-connected world, if you're not tapping into the genius, the cognitive genius out there, so I'm going to close with a little bit of, uh, of XPRIZE. So a little bit about incentive prizes. My passion growing up was I wanted to fly into space, you know, went to medical school, got my pilot's license, drank all the tang I could get my hands on with a desire to become an astronaut. Learned my chance of becoming an astronaut with one in a thousand. Never applied to, astronaut, to NASA. In fact, I won't go there. Anyway. Um, <coughs> A good friend, Greg Marinak, gave me this guy's book, The Spirit of St. Louis, and I learned that Lindbergh crossed the Atlantic in 1927 to win a prize, not just on a whim. And so I said, okay, I'm gonna create a prize for private space flight. It was gonna be $10 million. That was enough money to inspire the entrepreneurs, but not the Boeings and the Lockheeds. I didn't want them playing. You had to build a three-person spaceship, fly to 100 kilometers, land safely, and do it again within two weeks. That was the rules. Uh, we ended up having, amazingly, 26 teams from seven countries around the world who spent $100 million going after the prize. Uh, I was very proud. Uh, Adeo was on the board, uh, along with an amazing group of folks that helped uh, make this thing happen. Uh, I don't know, uh, Dad, are you still in the room here any place? Desher was one of our chief judges on the competition um, to oversee both the safety and the fact that they met all the rules. And on October 4th, 2004, in the Mojave Desert, uh, Spaceship One made its second flight uh, within, within two weeks. Here she is burning nitrous oxide laughing gas and polybutadiene tire rubber as fuel. Here's the shot at altitude. Uh, and then the winning moment, the Ansari family on the left, myself, Paul Allen, who had funded Burt Rutan, $27 million to go after the $10 million prize. <laughs> They're all after this. Um, but Paul made all his money back and then some. But I'm going to be the pilot. And Richard Branson, I can understand when I was going after this, announcing this prize in, 2000, in 1996, I didn't have $10 million. And I didn't have any teams. But that didn't stop us from announcing the prize. I have two of my trustees resign on the spot. Um, I'll, I'll teach something when second I think is really, really important. I talk about this in bold. It's when you give birth to a new idea, how the world learns about your idea really, really matters. You see, in each of our minds, we have this line of credibility. And if you announce an idea to the world below the line of credibility, people dismiss it out of hand. It's, that's a stupid idea, and they forget about it. If you launch above the line of credibility, well, they'll listen to you, they'll see how you do. And then there's this line of super credibility. And if you can announce your idea above the line of super credibility, people go, oh my god, how can I be involved? When is it going to happen? Isn't that amazing? So on stage with me, when we announced the prize in 1996, I didn't have one astronaut, I had 20 astronauts. I had the Lindbergh family. I had the head of NASA, the head of the FAA. Front page news, $10 million prize announced. Someone asked him money. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and we didn't lie about it, but we didn't. And we didn't have any teams. But it got highly, super credible. And I thought for sure someone would you know, pay you know, who wouldn't pay the $10 million after it was won? That's the great thing about incentive prize. You pay after it's accomplished. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, it took me five years asking 150 people. I asked Richard twice to fund the prize. Once with Virgin Atlantic, once with Virgin Mobile. And he turned me down both times. <laughs> and it was finally the Ansari family who funded it. Uh, they become dear friends of, of, of ours. But they ended up, we called it the Ansari X Prize in their honor. But the week before the X Prize is won, Richard Branson comes in and negotiates the rights to the winning technology. Wow. Um, commits $250 million to commercialize it, which I'm thankful I've got my seat on the next version and I'll go when Spaceship 2 is ready. But I was pissed at him for a while. <laughs> <laughs> we got 10 billion media impressions, uh, made the homepage of Google, and now the winning technology is actually hanging in the Smithsonian right next to the Spirit of St. Louis. 
that inspired it in the first place. So I hope you guys are all excited about space, but that's not my point here. The point here is that the dream was to fly into space, and I'll get my flight on the derivative vehicle here. But if you want to solve a problem, you can try and do it yourself, right? You could have backed 26 teams and hoped you backed the right team. Or you could put out a competition and have the world compete to solve your challenge, whatever it is, inside your company, your community, your industry, the world. On the heels of that, we built an amazing board of trustees from Larry Page, James Cameron, Elon, and many others. We now focus on prizes uh, across the spectrum. Uh, we have a $30 million prize to the moon, so that blast off, that splash down back at Idea Lab was reborn now as an X prize. And we have 24 teams around the world competing. Uh, we have a $10 million Qualcomm Tricorder X prize. And this is $10 million for the team to build a handheld device that is not for a doctor or a nurse, it's for our mom or dad at 2 a.m. in the morning when your kid is sick. They can cough on, you can talk to, you can do a finger blood prick and diagnose you for the team of board certified doctors. We had 330 teams enter that competition. We're down to the top eight, and we'll have a winner at the end of this year. Um, the prize we just finished launching is called the Global Learning X Prize. I'm very proud Elon put up $15 million for this prize. He's finally allowed us to, man, he kept it quiet for a long time. He finally allowed us to, allowed us to mention it. Uh, but this is for a Android application on a cell phone or tablet that can take a child anywhere in the world from illiteracy to basic reading, writing, numeracy in 18 months. Where are we going next? Flying <laughs> <laughs> cars, finally. Uh, it's a transporter X Prize. Um, pick you up and carry you autonomously, electrically, to the point you want to go. The Roddenberry family, the creators of Star Trek, have put up five million for this. We need another matching five million, so anyone who wants to uh, partner with them, uh, this prize is ready to launch. We're working on a cybersecurity X Prize. Uh, this would be a white hat, black hat competition every year. Create the best security, break it. Create the best security, break it. Uh, at TED, we announced our intentions for an AI human collaboration X Prize. We launched four X Prizes this year and uh, moving forward. If you'd like a copy of these slides, if you text, this will be up the next uh, hour or so. If you text your email, this number, you'll get a, you'll get a, a download of this. And I put out a tech blog every Sunday that you'll have an option for as well. So I don't know how much time, if I use all my time, or question time for a few. Well, we'll do a few questions too. So first off, uh, just r raise your hand if that was not like one of the oh most God. inspirational Woo! things you heard. Oh All right, All right. Amazing. Unbelievable. I'm like teary eyed in the front. I'm like, I'm so happy to be in technology. <laughs> All right, 